um, having them on the journey. Like my brother and sister are great too. Like this is funny. My sister calls me after the Buckley fight. I think you good? I'm like yeah. You sure you good? Like, yeah, I'm good. Why? Because that kick was crazy. <laughs> I was so mad. I looked at her and said, forget you, but I have a family that knows when to joke and knows when to that. It, like, I get tagged in that video probably three or four days every week since the 2020. Hello, everyone, and welcome back a brand new episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. My guest this week has been on an incredible journey and it's all culminating on November 24th in Washington, D.C. when he's going to be competing for and fighting in the PFL Championship finale against Josh Silvera and he'll be fighting for the PFL Light Heavyweight Championship belt but also $1 million. We're going to talk about that, but there's so much more to talk about. My guest this week is Impa Kasanganai. Impa, nice to meet you and uh, appreciate you coming on the show. Hey, Sandra, how are you doing? Thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Hell yeah, hell yeah. Um, Impa, before we're going to get into your story, your journey, the PFL Championship, I would just like to talk to you about the PFL in general because they've had an incredible year. You know, mm-hmm. outside of the events they've held, you know, the, the $100 million investment from Saudi Arabia, signing Jake Paul as an ambassador and, and as an investor, you know, signing, you know, Francis Ngannou, Amanda Serrano, launching PFL Europe, you know, just to be a part of the PFL family as a part of the roster. What's it been like just being involved with the promotion this year? Yeah, so being part of PFL has been a blessing, right? So seeing an organization grow the way it is and being a fighter, being an athlete, right? Um, it's a pretty exciting time. You see so many moving parts. I was at the, after I fought in San Antonio last, I went to New York to see the other semifinal, semifinal matches. And then I got to go out to PFL Europe and see what's going on over there. And they're doing some pretty exciting things. So it's just cool to see an organization growing in their own unique way, making their, you know, leaving a footprint on MMA, but also just being a fighter. And I'm grateful for the position that I'm in, you know, getting this title and everything else going on. But just being part of this is like, it's a super cool thing to be on the inside of, right? Yeah, absolutely. Can you even compare what this experience, you know, the last 12 months being a part of the PFL has been like for you versus, say, your time with the UFC in terms of how the two different promotions vary from a fighter's perspective? Yeah, so the two different promotions. So I like both staffs are amazing, right? So I think it starts there. People, the people, the people that people don't see, right? The ones that are really like, they are the people that keep the ship running, right? When I was in the UFC, I thought people behind the scenes, right? Like, I've talked to Dana before, but it wasn't like I talked to him more, but the people in the staff, like, anything I needed, whenever I needed, they helped me. And the PFL is just amazing at that, too. I can call anybody at any time, any time of the day, probably get a message in like literally 20 seconds sometimes. Um, and with my opportunities I have in PFL right now, like I commentated for the first time, you know, get to be uh, looking to be a bachelor of PFL Africa, go to other shows. I'm going to go to the PFL Europe final after this, you know, we we'll get this title. Um, I've got to do different photo shoots. They've, they've really considered me as an athlete and as a person, whereas in, P- in UFC, I just I didn't get those opportunities yet at that time when I was there. So it's like, I really think that my time in the PFL is like I'm really valued as an athlete. I'm valued as a person to say, hey, like, man, you keep earning your way up, you're going to get the opportunities too. And like Eduardo, Ray Sefo, Dan Hardy, like, they're always already considering me to like do more commentating, more opportunities with sponsors that the PFO really respects the music. The last week I did on Redcon, before that I did um, Model Century. Like, in the UFC, I didn't get any of those opportunities yet. So it was just, it's really, really cool. So the last 12 months has just been such a blessing, right? And mm-hmm. they, are in great communication. I actually just have a, I have a call later today with them because I'm doing a motorcycle ride from Virginia down to uh, DC, or sorry, down to Atlanta. And people was like, well, all over. That'd be super cool to be a part of, like, where I can come to them with ideas and they can come back to me and just be like, hey, how can we work on this together? So you just, you, like, I, I feel like I'm in a really, really cool position that's unique maybe to other fighters, but just other athletes in general. 
Yeah, it kind of reminds me a lot of when I was working for the PFL back in 2018, yeah. 2019. And that was a mantra that we had. It's like a, a, a more of a family environment where we had much closer relationships with the fighters. And we were always kind of figuring out ways of how we can, you know, work with the fighters outside yeah. of fight week, outside of fight night. So it's nice to kind of hear that that's still yeah. part of the, the promotion's values right now. That's amazing. But look at Sean O'Connell. He went from fighting, <laughs> commentating to fighting and even that. And it's like, laid that blueprint down it, it's super cool that people stuck with that and then just like hearing that from you like you guys definitely set a great standard and that fact that it's benefiting my life and people it, just that i love like it's just pretty cool to be a part of absolutely well like i said you know impa you've been on an incredible journey um i'm kind of going into the pfl championship especially with your fight as the fight i'm most looking forward to and i'm most interested in from a story perspective because i feel like when you look at the bigger picture this is the comeback of the year story potentially for you if you kind of go all the way and win the championship and the thing about the fight game you know there are there are a few sayings out there you know the the thrill and the agony the highest of the highs and the lowest of the lows and you know you're you've obviously experienced a lot of good times this year and hopefully you'll experience another one on november 24th uh but if it's okay with you i'd like to kind of to go back a little bit back to october of 2020 you know when you're on the receiving end of this incredible highlight reel knockout by Joaquin Buckley, could you just try to share what it was like going through that particular moment in your life, both the night of the fight, but then also the aftermath? This was like one of the most viewed viral knockouts we've ever seen. You know, Kanye West is posting about it. When you're on the receiving end of something like this, how are you processing it? Yeah, being on the receiving end of a highlight reel knockout like that, it was. It didn't bother me as a fighter. You know, I was just like, hey, like, this is what we do. I keep moving forward. And that was it. I, so the first thing I can remember <laughs> after getting knocked out, I was in the back of the arena. I uh, was so with Brian Barberina, my dad, and my teammate Diego at the time. And I looked at him, what happened? Like, uh, I'm trying to like, say, like, uh, we can't really tell you how it happened. And I was like, no, what happened? Like, you got kicked. I'm like, oh, like a head kick? He's like, yeah, it was a head kick, but it wasn't just a regular head kick. But really, to me, it wasn't a regular head kick. It's like, I try to grab my phone. It's like, don't look at your phone right away. It's like, all right. So I'm sitting there. And then I, I guess I'll still kind of come into it. It's like, what happened? He's like, just wait. So I kept asking what happened because my brain was still coming to I walk out and uh, a friend of mine, he's also an agent, but Danny Rubenstein was out there. And I said, hey, what happened? He's like, you just got a little bit lazy and you got hit with a great kick. I was like, okay. So I'm starting to think, and everybody's kind of looking at me like, is he okay? And I was just like walking in the back and was like, why is everybody staring at me like that? Like, how bad was this kick? Because I didn't see anything yet. And I just, I don't remember from the time I got knocked out to walking out the cage. I, I don't remember any of it. So um, I get in the ambulance with my dad and he's like, okay, grab your phone now. So I look at my phone and I'm like, okay. Good kick. Yeah, great shot. It wasn't lucky. It was an awesome shot. I, I, kept, I caught the kick three times and I didn't really respond with it well. Like no cowbring. It's coached better than that for sure. And I look at my dad and said, hey, don't worry, I'll finish the next guy. And we were on our way to the hospital in Abu Dhabi. I'm looking out. I'm just kind of, it was, it was really weird too. It was really eerie. It was like dark, very dark at night or early morning, whatever time, because like the time zone was different. But I'm looking out and I just kind of felt like it was in a whole new world. Just, it was sand and like little old buildings, kind of ruins. You could tell it was the outskirts of the city. But it was really kind of just like a moment where I got to think and be like, okay, like I'm going to be a champion one day. And I told my dad, I said, don't worry. Play the highlight as much as you want, but the dad became a champion, play the highlight too. So I'm sitting in the hospital, I'm telling them, I'm fine. Like, it's fighting, right? You keep moving forward. And they're like, we just want to check you, make sure you're good. And I said, no worries. And I got back stateside that weekend and I was back in the gym on Monday. And for me, it was never, oh, you sit in your sadness and do this. The, the girl I was dating at the time, uh, went and got food, got back to work and you know, hung up my brother and my sister. And that was about it. I didn't, I didn't have time to cry about it. My parents have been through a lot. They're from Congo. They see all these different things. And they just say, like, hey, like, you chose to fight. You have no reason to make an excuse. And I, I'll never make an excuse. I just look at them like, I'm going to make it happen. So it's pretty cool because uh, I made a post. You know, shout out about me for doing well. I had a great time in Abu Dhabi. Besides getting knocked out, it's probably my favorite fight weeks ever because the first time my dad ever cornered me. He didn't right. grow up fighting. I was just having him there. Um, and then he just handled it like a professional, just did everything he could. I'm with the weight cut. You know, it was new for him seeing his son cut weight for the first time, but it was an amazing time. So when I look back on the experience of the flag I carry today, actually, the first one was going to walk in with the Congolese and the American flag. You know, see, you have to like sew your flags together, or have them like attached a certain way. And uh, my dad's like, I can sew. 
Are you from Seoul? And so it's like, I carry that flag everywhere. I have blood on it now, but that's like some of those moments that you can't replace. I'm like, even though I lost that fight, I got knocked out. It, it did so much for me that week. After the fight, I write this post. Joe Rogan reshares it. I'm blessed. My followers go up. I'm like, what's going on? And it's like, and he just seems like, that's how you respond to it. So there's just so many different things. And like somebody told me they printed it out my post and shared it in their kitchen for their kids to see whenever they go through a challenging time. And that's like a moment in my life where my mindset was like, whatever you do, you respond well and you like, you make the most of it because you're not the only one that's watching yourself. Other people are watching you too, kids, families. So that, that was that for me. And that was like my mindset right after. And then I'm grateful. I did go finish the next fight, you know, lost the one after that. And then, you know, I was in the UFC anymore, but I was telling people, thank God the UFC caught me because and now I'm in PFL. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that is an incredible story. I really uh, want to thank you for, sh- for sharing that because it de- definitely sure. feels like from a bad situation, there's so much optimism and positivity, the glass half full mentality. Right. And if I could just kind of uh, just pick on something that you mentioned there, the relationship with your father, you know, and your family in general, it seems like it was so important to you, especially at that particular moment in time, obviously having your dad with you during fight right. week and on fight night. How important has it been to have your family included on your on your overall MMA career thus far? Oh man, trying to make me cry out here. That's what you're trying to do today. I'm trying to make me cry. Uh, having my family as a part of my MMA journey is super cool. Like I could take it back to when I finished college. I was gonna either go to the military or get my CPA. And then I was like, well, like I finished the accounting and finance degrees, and I was like, ah, I want to go to special ops. I just want to do something like high speed. You know, I wanted to see like challenge myself, whether it's enlist or go officer candidacy school. Officer candidacy school, and um, I talked to my parents, and I was like, hey. I had, you know, had one amateur fight, took it on three weeks' notice, and then I was starting to count my parents. Like, hey, good, you got it out of your system. And I was training, and I was thinking, I didn't have my second amateur fight yet, and I just left this accounting job. They gave me a promotion that day. <laughs> and my mom just looks at my dad, and she just rolls over in bed and says, talk to your son. She was, they were not happy at first. And I was working at this grocery store. I worked in high school. I was bouncing. started training clients and had no business acumen at the time. So I was like training group, like pretty much what, Came out to be like ten dollars a session. It was just terrible. And my mom was like, "Like, but if I'm not in the UFC in two years, I'll go back and get my CPA. And that's what I'll focus on." So, my mom's like, not happy at all. My dad's like, "We'll talk later," <laughs> you know. And um, I just focused on training all day, every day at gym. I sometimes I sleep at the gym. I, I just wanted to make it. I took fights nonstop. And uh, then you know, my parents came around and started coming to other fights and super supportive, let me stay home. We, we had a deal. Got in the UFC, but, you know, I had my first opportunity in the UFC, about a year and a half, training and got um, to the Contender Series. I won, but I didn't get the contract. And it's actually pretty cool. If you look back on my data, why it goes, one of these other organizations signed him. I believe he'll be top five in the world, world champion one day, but especially just needs work. So it's cool like, to look back on that. And my parents were like, okay. And I was like, well, I didn't get in the UFC, so I'm going to go me fighting and I'll just get my CPA. Like I made, that was my word. And it was really cool because my parents were like, no, like forget the kick counting, forget all that. Go back and let's see if you get back on the contender series or you're shot to be in the UFC. And that meant a lot because they're tough. You know, they come from another country, their education's major, but I could just see where like they turned around and my little brother played college basketball after me and my little sister, she just committed to West Point. So like you see it kind of trickle down and credit to my parents because just back home, you don't have sports as a high value thing right so the number of those coaching at the university of tennessee put in men's basketball so it's like you like you see things happen and being the oldest of three sometimes you just have to kind of have that battle right mm-hmm. but my parents are always about supporting us and seeing us shine but my dad's like if you're gonna do you gotta do with excellence so i don't want to hear you complain he'll call me before fights like don't come home if you lose you better come home out here and you better go fight like a man so it, it's cool but it helps me out and um Having their support, it's just like, it challenges me. It inspires me. I see them never complain. My mama works 17 hours shifts as a nurse. And when I get to include them on this journey, it just like, it's a thank you to them for all the sacrifices that they made. Uh, a few weeks ago, my mom actually seen me train for the first time. I didn't even realize. She was like, this is what training's like. Yeah. And the yeah, thought came to film and I'm looking at her and they, this video and it's like the first time she came and feel so honored they wanted to ask her questions like you want to ask me questions about my son like those moments that you can't there's not a million but you don't can't you can't give me a million dollars 
time and time again that could ever replace that, right? Like it just gave me billions of it. It would never replace that moment where she sees me train with like my team, Coach Dieter, uh, Lens, everybody, like and just having a good weekend together in Florida with like, man, this dream was worth it. So um having them on the journey, like my brother and sister are great too. Like, this is funny. My sister calls me after the Buckley fight. I think you good? I'm like, yeah. You sure you good? Like, yeah, I'm good. Why? Because that kick was crazy. <laughs> I was so mad. I looked at her and said, forget you, but I have a family that knows when to joke and knows when to that. It, like, I get tagged in that video probably three or four days every week since the 2020. But having your family already roast you, you're like, we're good. And we have a great time. My brother calls me before we fight. He'll pray. He'll check on me. Like, how you doing? And I mean, I wouldn't be here without them. So I just thank God for it all. I love it. That's a that's a beautiful story. And, uh, you know, you're very blessed and lucky to have a family like that around you to support you on your journey. If if the if the impulse of today, who's about to fight for a million dollars and fight for the light heavyweight championship at the PFL could go back and speak to the impa the night after or the day after the week after the Buckley fight, what would you say to that guy? Well, I can talk to myself after the Buckley fight from today, I would say way to keep the faith. You know, like I would just be like, because I was I, I thought I could fight right away. I didn't realize I had some suspension. So I was already texting, telling the agents, can I fight? But like, yeah, you're, gonna, you're suspended for 60 days. I was like, for, for what? Right? But um, I would just sit there and look at him and be like, it was kind of weird because you're like, man, like, I messed up, right? I made a mistake. You capitalized on it. Great shot. But I said, you got to keep the faith. And there are times, you know, you challenge them because I'm just not fighting, but you're just like wondering what's going on in your personal life, right? And uh, when I said it, I was like, hey, play that highlight as much as you want. I wonder when I get that title, play that highlight too. I was speaking again out of faith, and I was like, there's a lot that I need to work on. I remember I said, I need training partners that can beat me up. And then I made the move down to Kill Cliff. I was saying for a time, but now Kill Cliff. And there was just like, really no money, right? Like early contract in the UFC, contender series contract. But I was like, keep the faith. So I just sit down with my, the input of 2020 and be like, it was all worth it. And say, now go get the job done, right? We're going we're gonna to go get the job done November 24th. Hell yeah, I love that attitude. Um, you know, you, you kind of go through your UFC journey and you guys part ways, mm -hmm. you fight for Eagle FC, XMMA. When did the opportunity to join the PFL first present itself to you? Oh, uh, so fought Eagle, fought the XMMA, and then about maybe seven, eight months later, I fought, well, about six months later. So I fought the Eagle fight, or I started an XMMA fight in the summertime of last year. And then nobody was taking a fight. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. And um, this is pretty cool. So there's a song called The Story I'll Tell by Maverick City Music. And my mom reminds me of it. So I'm playing it in Abu Dhabi. And I just like the song. So the story I'll tell got my God on the fail. And I didn't listen to that song since Abu Dhabi. So yeah, I've got it. So we're going to just take it off the playlist. And I called everybody out in the UFC. I called everybody out anywhere, organization. I didn't care. Heavyweight to Walter I didn't care. I'd fight every single one of them. I am getting sick. I stopped infection. I was in the hospital and then a couple of fights dropped at like, the, like regional promotions. And then um, I'm just praying in the shower one day. I had worship music on and that song came on. I was like, why did this song come on? It was on like on a random worship list. And at that same time, the agent texted me. It's like, hey, PFL's a new opportunity to fight on the Challenger Series. He said, you'll fight any weight class. Let's go. And I'm like, what? At the same time, so that song really sticks out to me. So it was about the winter at the end of 2022, I want to say. And they said, hey, you ready to fight in March for the Challenger Series, whatever time I fought this year. So I was still healing. I didn't tell anybody. And I still I was like packing a wound. I was an inch and a half deep into my leg, still after the hospital. And I was just like in a really like weird, dark place in my life, just like trying to figure out what's next. I was like, okay, like I'll be ready to fight, whether I'm still bleeding on my leg or like um it's healed up so it was like a weird camp got sick a lot but we got the job done got the knockout and um, a summer society and been you know we've been seeing the journey since 
Yeah, you know what's crazy about the PFL Challenger series? It's almost a little bit like history repeating itself. It's like yeah. you had to fight on contender series to kind of get into the UFC and it took two attempts to do that. And then you had to win the PFL Challenger series to kind of get it a, a, a full on PFL contract. So was there yeah. a little bit of deja vu, a little bit of same similar mindset going into both those situations for you? In a way. So the Challenger series, a lot, the mindset was a lot closer to me fighting on the contender series for the second time. Because the first time I'm like on the contender series, like I, like I explained it, like I was a little puppy, like, oh, this is exciting, UFC, Vegas, let's go. And then the second time I came, like, okay, like I'm here just to take the take this opportunity. And then after the first time, the second time the contender series, I fought nine days later, a few a few days later, to fight Rocky Patolo. The same with PFO. Before I walked out the cage, Ray Sefro and Eduardo came up to me and were like, you ready to fight soon? I said, yeah, I win. They said a couple weeks, so you're fighting in Vegas. And I thought I was right into the season, but it was another showcase fight to get the opportunity to get into the PFL officially as an alternate. So I was like, all right, like take those challenges. But if I didn't go through those moments before, I don't think I'd have been ready then. I wouldn't have been ready now because it really helps you focus, helps you like, because I know when to enjoy life. I know when to work. I know when to push myself. But like that really made me hungry because the first time I was on contender series and I won, I probably never cried so hard. I was in that locker room like hurt. Yeah, I go to Jim and say like, you earned it, but you didn't get the contract. So that's like, it made me train differently, harder, push myself, and um, take advantage of every opportunity, like no excuse. And it was good for, it was good for me. I didn't see it at the time, but it was good for me then and still good for me now. So in football, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm going to school and college. It was like big time players, make big time plays and big time games. So it didn't really... It didn't affect me at all. I was like, let's go. Challenger series. Let's make this opportunity happen. And guy Taylor Johnson fought right before me. He got it finished. And they're like, okay, well, that guy might get the contract. And he walks past me. He says, hey, it's your turn to go get that KO. He's a cool guy. We're friends. I was like, I will. And I got the first round knocked out. I was like, let's go. So when I see moments like this, when I see moments like this title fight or whatever, like, I don't know the claim that victory, you know, saying dialed in. But it was a big thing that challenged my maturity as a fighter and as a man. Like, I was like, just go get the job done. And uh, you've been doing it. You have been doing it. You've been on absolute fire this year. Yeah, you, you know, the one things that um, a lot of people perhaps don't realize and why the PFL, I guess, system process journey is so different to anything else in MMA. Cool. It's the number of fights that are condensed into a six, seven, eight month period. Like cool. you competing on November 24th will be your fifth fight in around about seven months or so and change. Could you just try and share with the listeners and the, and the viewers what that journey has been like for you, just physically to kind of go through that grueling schedule? Yeah, so let's see. Five fights in about seven months, right? And you have to stay dialed in. Like, so be, let's say you have, in other words, since you fight twice a year, you might have six weeks of camp, so maybe 12 weeks out of a 52-week year, you're in camp. PFL, especially if you come with the Challenger Series, you might be in camp for 30 plus weeks, right? And even though I had 15 weeks between my last fight and this one coming up, that's 15 weeks of where you still need to stay dialed in and focused and work on things and build your life. Whereas some fighters don't even train until they have a camp. PFL, you don't have that choice, right? And it's like not a choice that I would take, but that's that. So mentally, you need to be dialed in at all times, be ready to take correction at all times. Like you don't get to just kind of pull off and chill or, or say, hey, like, you know, like, I don't, I don't feel like doing this today. Like, it's just go, go, go. And that's like, to me, it shows like your love for it, like you're, that you're on a warpath. And I think that, I think that can break people sometimes in PSL. Like, they're not dialed in and ready to keep going. And then depending on who they're fighting, they maybe take it as like, oh, gosh, why isn't the challenge the long way? For me, I like it. I say, like, lead me along the right path because my, my enemies are waiting for me. Like, that's what I want, you know? And, I just want to take them all out. I was, I, I mean, it'd be fun if people had more fights in the season, I think. If you had like a, it'd be an even number six to eight fights and then you go, right? And I just, I just love that activity. Um, the, the grind of it is like injury prevention, knowing when to rest, knowing when not to get sick. Staph infections are there. Um, fractured bones, right? Anything, anything that can pop up in a season or in a fighter's life or just the, the grind of it all three or four sessions per day and then you get a couple of days off but you need to be there for your teammates so you're right back and then you're fighting again in a few weeks and it's a new opponent new style new person for me it's a weight class up technically it's two weight classes up from the lowest one that i've ever fought in so you start figuring it out like fighters fight 
if we, you know, I mean, who thought it says fighters fight, and that's what I just came down to. Like, I don't care who it is, what their style is, what they do, just like go out work, I'll hustle, I'll fight them, go beat them up. And you have to commit to that, not based on how you feel like fighting, not based on whatever. It's just like, go take the person out, go take the person out, whatever it is. I don't care like how bloody it gets, how tired, what injuries there, just. I can rest after the fight. And sometimes after the fight, like I'll chill the team and never, and then I get on that flight and I'm probably snoring the entire flight back. But then it's like, right when I land, it's time to go. Cause I would say camp doesn't end until you get back home and unpack your bags. Sorry. You know, camp doesn't end until you get back home and unpack your bags. So that's what my, that's what my mindset is. And it's just, that's the grind of it all. And I think that it is the most challenging gauntlet in all of combat due to the activity. Uh, it doesn't take away from other organizations and what they do, but when you have to be that active, you don't have a choice or you can just pull out or whatever. I guess people have a choice to quit, but that doesn't go well, right? And it really challenges you to say, like, I think when history says, when history is all said and done, and you look at fighters from the PFL who've done really well, they definitely get to say they're some of the greatest because they stay that active at all times. And I guess the, the, the level of fighters rise, the level of tournaments, the level of stakes rise. I think it'll just be a testimony to what PFL has created in the MMA landscape. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the the light at the end of the tunnel, the major incentive, the the <laughs> carrot being dangled on this mm-hmm. journey yeah. is that championship belt, but also a that's million it. dollars. Right. That's just not available in any other organization right now. Yeah. And especially in multiple weight classes within the same year. Um, on the money side, first of all, Winning a million dollars, how would that impact your life right now? What would that mean to you? Oh, man. We go get that million dollars. It's going to just be an opportunity to change my parents' life, my life, and the people around me, my trainers, right? The ones who really helped me build here. It's also going to be something, too, like where the million dollars is great, and I can show that it's possible. But, you know, for me, I want to really reinvest it and say, like, this million becomes 20 one day. It becomes more. Um, Work a lot with Live Wealth Group. You know, they give me advice on like how to properly manage the money, whether it's high risk, middle tier risk, and then low risk and investments, right? Like I want to be the athlete that shows when you put like your mind to it and you want things to be done differently, you're going to do things differently. So I want to work. I want to go back and reinvest in myself and get my MBA, um, you know, pursue that, keep building business and then show like you've seen like the, the players like LeBron or you've seen Tom Brady, you've seen uh, Magic Johnson, people who've done really well in business, Andre Iguodala, like guys who've done so well in business outside of sports. Like, I think that's what that million dollars starts to set. It's like that first initial capital. So, it becomes something that not just changes my life now, but there's no debt. And I'm, you know, definitely financially free at this point in my life. But I see it as a stepping stone for what's to come and what it's going to become. Like, reinvesting back in myself properly, not just, I would love 20 motorcycles for sure, but that's not really the most intelligent decision. But I see it as a way for me to say, hey, like, if you really want to be the greatest at what you do and, and, and in and outside of the cage, you got to invest in yourself and like create a blueprint for what fighters can follow rather than just, just go buy a house and hopefully it deals with good renters. I want to be something where it's like, wow, he took that money, he planted his seed, he was patient, he waited 10, 15 years and look at his life now. He's in, in his 40s and the world is his oyster. And then keep building from there. And then just show other fighters. I want it to be something that's like what a million dollars can do and then what it just does in one moment. And uh, that's why I see it's going to happen. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Impa, but you've got degrees in business administ- administration, accounting, and finance. And, and I feel yes, like sir. that is you know one area of the fight game where fighters could get more help in terms of how they manage their money, how they invest their money, and how they can make whatever they earn in a very short fight career, you know, so, long term. And is that something that you'd like to maybe get involved with, uh, you know, post your fight care when you do retire? Yes, sir. It was something definitely get involved with after you know, I retire, but also actually currently doing it now. I'm head of athlete relations with a company called Live Wealth Group. And uh, that's the one who's also helped me make the right investments. So it's one-stop financial service stop where we have accounting, finance, life insurance policies, uh, financial planning, you name it. Um, recently, you know, I signed on a corporate wellness account uh our chef account and some other businesses already and some other athletes but um with that it's to help people grow and see that they can have a much better life if they're patient and put their money in the right place so it's just creating plans for them helping people uh 
will be financially secure now and for the future, reorganizing their accounting records and finance. And it's really helped me a lot too with everything that I have going on already. And just kind of like setting up those nest eggs for a great future. So as I continue to grow with Live Wealth and Alan and everyone, I want to see like other fighters just never have to worry again, right? Because you know, for me, I have uh, me as a fighter, as a business, uh, with Live Wealth, the refinery where I train a lot of clients. Um, just made a pretty cool partnership recently with TRX and uh, a really great tennis trainer here in the area. So um, just showing fighters that you can diversify your income and use your platform to leverage that to become financially free forever. Because I've been in that point in my life where I literally had nothing. And then at a point in my life now where I'm grateful that technically fighting doesn't have to pay the bills, but it's going to be a great way just to take what I earned in fighting to only invest. Then that's a goal of mine. Like from the end of the season on, never use my fighting money to be something that has to be how I have to live my life, but only as investments and see where that can go. Absolutely, I love hearing that. That that's that's Thanks. great. I wish more fighters had the the knowledge uh, and the uh, access to the knowledge of stuff like this to kind of manage their finances. So the money, the million dollars, is just kind of like half of the pie, uh, potentially right. on November twenty fourth. The championship belt, becoming a PFL champion. What would that mean for you, uh, for your legacy in this sport? And and perhaps is that maybe even more important to you right now as a oh. competitor than perhaps the money? Yeah, getting that title. I want to go get that title on November twenty fourth. That's much more important for me than getting a million dollars. I believe I believe I'm smart enough and have the right people in my life to say, hey, like, and I will put the work in to say I can get a million dollars a week, a month, right? You know, one day with the people that I have around me. Uh, sometimes it's funny because fighting, like, it's on such a schedule. You don't even get to work on other things like you'd like to because of the training schedule, which I love. And that's a lot of the success in my life now is contingent on me knocking people out or cutting these victories. But getting a title, it just never goes away, right? Money comes and goes. Like you can grow it, you can lose some of it. But once you have the title and you do things right, you can lose the belt. The belt can be physically gone, but you'll always be a champion. And to be a champion in an organization that challenges you with a schedule like this, to me, that's something I always hold on a pedestal, right? And it's always something that I can say, like, you know, we talk about the Buckley fight, we talk about what I've been through, we can talk about that. I started training when I was 24 years old, or whatever you want to say, like, but to get a title now at 29 and goals to get 12 more from this one, right? It just, for me, one, it's cool to have. It's a testimony to the trainers and teammates that I have and people in my life, a testimony to God and where he's called me, the gifts that he's given me. But also, too, like I can show the kids at the boxing gym, like you can do it too. The guys in the gym, they're going to do it too. And like my family and future generations always see like, their family member, their ancestor one day, right, is a champion. Like that to me is super cool. And it just it's an honor to all the ones who came before me. The sacrifices my parents made. And my dad coming to the United States with sixteen dollars in his pocket. And then I can walk into my mom's work and be like, hey, you're not working anymore. Like because I've always wanted to have that championship mindset. My mentor, Jonathan Logan, has said it was never a matter of if, it was just a matter of when. And now is that win time, right? And it's like when we go get it, it's like Man, we've been talking about this sitting at the front desk working at his, his gym when I first started fighting as an amateur. I'm talking to guys like Scott Holtzman for two hours on the phone as an amateur. Like, what does it take to get here? The sacrifices, the relationship you cut off, the relationships you add on, the advice you're willing to take, the coach calling you out on being a jerk, like different little things in your life that all come together. Like, that championship is a culmination of all of that. Leaving North Carolina to come back down to Florida and and be in a gym like this and leaving everything behind to say, this is why I came here. You know, like whatever the sacrifice may be, that title represents all of that. And then the more that come of the greatest fights and the bigger fights, right? Whatever you want to call it, every fight's a fight. Um, that will be so special to me. And then on November 25th, when I wake up with that title and that belt and we hit the road motorcycle, it's going to be like, man, like, it was worth it, right? I'm going to do something here, right? So this guy, my guy, right here, Cliff Barrett, he's from behind the scenes. He saved my life once, right? And we were at a kidney failure. And um, we were actually friends in college. We played college football together. We both had a dream to talk about building our, blending our passions. And he's an amazing filmmaker. Stay tuned for what he's going to make. But I was like, what do you want to do? He's like, ah, oh, make film. 
And I was sitting on a bus. I was like, I, I think I'm going to fight. I think I can do something similar to McGregor or different. I didn't have a fight yet, but I just believed. And it goes back to that conversation on that bus ride at one of our last college football games. Like, yo, we can do something special. And now we're we moved down here. We're, we're working together. We're going to be telling great stories. But that belt, to me, is every single one of those conversations, every single one of those moments. Him saving my life. When he went to Mississippi and I still try to fight with the kid, he fell. He's like, no, you're not. <laughs> like, Having things like that and just saying, you stay in the course, that's what that belt means to me. Wow. What a story. I love it. You, you yeah. just got me even more excited about this fight. <laughs> your, your opponent, Josh Silvera, son mm. of Conan Silvera, the owner, yeah. founder of American Top Team. He's been on a tear himself. You know, he's what? finished all of his opponents. This is a, an incredible story and an incredible fight in the light heavyweight division for the PFL. I guess when you look at what he's done this year, how do you break him down? And stylistically, how do you match up with him, do you think? Um, Josh is good. Uh, how do I say it's like, so I really respect what he's done, one. Uh, to I met him on a flight. So we keep going back to Abu Dhabi, but actually I met Josh the first time on the flight to Abu Dhabi. Wow. He was still fighting in LFA. So it's just a funny thing. And I actually have a picture. Cliff was with me. And we're sitting down in my first fight of PFL when I wasn't even in the season yet. And uh where was I? Where was I? Uh we're sitting down like I was just like signing some papers and we're sitting right across from each other. Right? It's just funny. We started laughing, hey yeah, man, I haven't seen you since Abu Dhabi, da da da. How you doing? I really respect that he's doing this. You know, he's on this path with his dad. I I respect him as a fighter. He's a good fighter everywhere, right? Grappling, stand up. He has his, you know, he has his strengths. I respect him. I'm gonna dominate the fight. I'm gonna claim the victory and move forward. Like I see me finishing the fight early on. I'm not gonna be impatient or I'm gonna take what God gives me. But I'm gonna set that tone from the beginning and and everywhere. I go, I'll do better. You know, I'll work out, out hustle and outside him in every position of this match. And, you know, when I finish my hand raise, claim the victory, nothing to boast on because it's not me alone. I'm not self made, but it's a testimony to, like I said, my coaches, my teammates, like the gym, everybody, like things I don't even know about, right? And he's a guy who's lived in MMA, lived the MMA experience since he was a kid. He was a kid on the mats. His dad, yeah, you know, a legend. He's, his dad coached two of my coaches, right? And so it's like you see that full circle moment and uh, things like that make me. I think it's a cool moment with like a full circle moment, like a passing of the torch to my to my coach is saying like, thank you, Conan, for what you've done and the way he's coached them. And he's helped make my coaches who they are today. And I get to fight his son, right? What mm -hmm. a cool history. The American top team, Joe Cliff, you know, top of the black zone. Like, I get to be a part of history. This is me, I didn't grow with, and I just feel honored that I've been selected and earned my way here. Josh, good fighter, like I said. I like his goofy person, that goofy style, and I think it shows through the way he fights. But November 24th, we cut through all that, finish him, claim that, you know, claim that victory with my hand, move forward with the belt onto the next season. So um, that's how I look at it, and that's I'm gonna take on all of that. Man, I can't wait. Like I said, Impa, you know, this is the fight I'm most looking forward to. It's why I wanted you to have you on the show to kind of talk to you about this. Um, I'm incredibly excited. I've been, you know, a fan of the PFL in general uh, before I worked there, you know, even yeah. after I left the company. I think they're doing great things, uh, especially with the year they've had. And, you know, you being part of this journey with them this year, it's a beautiful story. I hope this story can get out there a little bit more in the lead up Thank to you. November 24th. Because like I said, if things go well for you, when you look at the big picture, this is, in my opinion, the MMA comeback of the year, just given where you were and where you're at right now. But um, like I said, I really appreciate you having you on. And best of luck on November 24th against Josh Lavera for the PFL Light Heavyweight Championship and also that $1 million. Thank you so much for having me on. It's an honor and I'm, I'm really blessed. Thanks for the interview. It was a great time. Hell yeah. Take care, my man, and we'll speak to you soon. Good luck on 24th. Thank you. Talk to you soon. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. It really means a lot to me. And hey, listen, if you enjoyed this episode, please go and give it a follow on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows.